Oh, good. Well, we are going to get started. I'm going to hand it over to Jared and Haley, but thank you all for joining us today for this session with, with Sarah and Jared and Haley. Take it away. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. We are very happy to have Sarah Hurwitz with us. Um, so from 2009 to 2017, Sarah Hurwitz served as a White House speechwriter, first as a senior speechwriter for President Barack Obama, and then as head speechwriter for First Lady Michelle Obama. Prior to serving in the Obama administration, Sarah was chief speechwriter for Hillary Clinton on her 2008 presidential campaign. Sarah is the author of Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life in Judaism, after finally choosing to look there. All right. So today we're just going to be asking Sarah a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor, and all of you guys can ask questions for her as well. So well, let's get started. Um, our first question for Sarah is, how did you get to be the head speechwriter for Michelle Obama? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. I love BBYO. I wish I had done BBYO when I was in high school. So I'm, it's really, it's great to be here. Um, you know, it's funny. I actually got my start as an intern in college. I interned in the White House in the summer of 1998 in the vice president's speechwriting office. And the writers I worked for, they helped me get my first two jobs out of college, both of which were total failures. Like both jobs, I just totally failed at. In fact, my second one was as a speechwriter for a U.S. senator, and the chief of staff sat me down after nine months and was like, you should go to law school. That would be better for you than speechwriting, which was like somewhat painful. So I did, went to law school, and you know, I just, no one had taught me how to write a speech. I was a good writer, but I just didn't know how to speechwrite. In law school, I happened to meet a guy named Josh Gottheimer, who is now a congressman from New Jersey, but back then, he was one of my classmates. He had previously written speeches for President Clinton, and the two of us just started like freelance speech writing together, and he really taught me how to write a speech. So we worked on a couple of campaigns in 2003 and 2004, and both those people we worked for, they both lost. I then worked on Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign, campaign for president as her speech writer, and she lost. So again, I have now had two failed jobs and worked on three losing campaigns, okay? So no one was, I don't think anyone at the time was like, wow, she is really, really successful, really crushing it. But I got really lucky. I got hired on Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2008, and he actually won, which was a new experience for me. And so I got to go to the White House and be a speech writer for him there. But on the campaign, I worked a little bit with Mrs. Obama. I had, I had helped her with a big speech for the Democratic National Convention. So when we went to the White House, while I was writing for him, I would help her out a little bit just on the side. And after two years of writing for him, I just decided that I liked writing for her better. And in a very surprising White House career move, I moved, work, I moved from working for the president to the first lady, which is really unusual. People usually, they move from the first lady to the president, but I just knew it was the right move. I just I felt more at home in her voice and just more comfortable working for her. So that was what I did. Great. So um, can you just talk about a little bit, like, what was it like working for the Obamas? Can you give us somewhat of a behind the scenes look, I guess you could say, about like what it was like working for them? Yeah. They're awesome. I mean, they're, they're both people, like, you know, I'll, I'll talk about Mrs. Obama just because I worked for her much longer. Like Michelle Obama is someone who knows who she is and she always knows what she wants to say. So like people will often say to me, oh, you know, you put words in her mouth or like you scripted her. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like this is a woman, nobody scripts Michelle Obama. So what I would do is I would sit down with her before a speech and just ask her, like, what do you want to say? And she would dictate all of this great language, like paragraphs of beautiful stories and moving sentences and all these ideas. And I would type as fast as possible on my laptop because I wanted to just capture everything she was saying. And that would be really the heart of the speech. And then I would go back to my office. I would kind of shape into a draft. And then I would send that draft around to like 50 people in the White House. Right, I'd send it to lawyers, policy people, communications people, fact checkers. You know, the Obama White House, we were really, really concerned about always making sure what we said was accurate, about always telling the American people the truth. So we had a lot of fact checking. Like, if I started a speech by saying, oh, it's so great to be here with my friend, mayor so-and-so, a fact checker would be like, Mrs. Obama has referred to this mayor as her friend, but are they really friends? Like, how long have they known each other? It's like, okay, guys, but that was the level of scrutiny. And then I would give the draft to Mrs. Obama and we would go back and forth, right? She would edit, I would edit her edits, she would edit my edits. It was a lot of back and forth and then she would deliver it. And you know, 
when she delivered her speeches, I often got to go with her. So like I traveled all over America, I traveled to Asia, to Africa, to South America, to Europe with her. And just, it was amazing whether it was with her or President Obama, it was just amazing to like drive through the streets of any country and just see people lining the streets, like waving American flags, cheering, crying. You know, like if you think about it, like do you know who the first lady of pick a country is? Argentina, Japan, Ghana, like, do you know? I, I have no idea who the first lady of any of those countries are, but no matter what country we went to, like kids would just be like screaming and so excited to meet her. Like they all knew who she was. And I think they really, they just admired her and admired her story. So it was, and it was amazing eight years, just an amazing eight years. That's amazing. Well, just like a quick follow up, like, are you and Michelle Obama, like, are y'all still close today? Are y'all still friends and in touch? <laughs> y'all had a really, very close relationship. Yeah, so I did stay in touch with her and with her, and I stayed in touch with her and also like with the people who work for her, with my colleagues who kind of after the White House went with her to her, the next part of her life. So I have, you know, it's been a while since I've seen her, but I'm, I'm, I like pitch in on little things here and there, just projects to help her. And she's just been She's so great. Like I, I wrote a book about Judaism, which we're going to talk about. And when it came out, she sent this like epic tweet, which was like, it was the, it still makes me cry whenever I look at it. It's like the most beautiful tweet I've ever seen. And I just, she's just been incredibly supportive as is everyone on her team now. So yeah, I love them. And I've seen President Obama um, a few times since the White House because I help out with the Obama Foundation a little bit mm -hmm. on one of their committees. And it's very funny because he's still, you know, he's, he's been working on his memoir at the same time that I was working on my book. So like every time we saw each other, we'd be like, oh, writing a book is so hard. He's like, I know, it's the worst. I'm like, oh, I hate it. We would just like complain. And then, then I actually finished mine and like handed in the manuscript and I was complaining about it. He was like, wait, 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 you just handed in the manuscript. Like we're not in the same boat anymore, right? Like don't, I don't want to hear this. Like you are in a different situation now, but yeah, they're great. That's awesome. Um, going like back on to the speech part of it. Um, do you ever disagree with someone when you're writing speeches? And what happens when like, you have a different opinion than them? Yeah, so two levels of that question, I think like, I don't, I, I just don't, if, if I disagree with someone on fundamental values, policies, like fundamental beliefs, I just won't write with them. I won't write for them. I only write for people whose values I really share. You know, I just, you know, when you're writing speeches for someone, you're you're helping them articulate a set of values and ideals. So if you don't agree with that, that's gonna be morally very, very uncomfortable, right? I just wouldn't be comfortable writing for someone who, who was doing things that I thought were wrong. I just couldn't tolerate that. I will say I once, I knew a speechwriter who agreed with his boss on everything except for the death penalty. She was pro-death penalty, he was against it. And they actually negotiated this arrangement whereby if she ever spoke about the death penalty, he just wouldn't write it. She would have to write it herself. Like, okay, I can see doing something like that. Now, another level of disagreement is like, what if they disagree with how to say something, right? If I, like, what if I write a sentence and they don't like it? And I think, you know, we kind of disagree as to how to say something. In that case, I would say to Mrs. Obama, like, I don't know, maybe, you know, what about saying it this way? And if she said yes, great. And if she said no, then I just backed off, right? Because it's her speech. She's the one who's going to be standing at that podium, not me. So at the end of the day, my job really is just to channel her and support her and then she does what she wants to do. So um, speaking of morals and things you believe in, in your book, you talk about how you thought you were a good person by studying Jewish ethics and they made you realize that you weren't a good person. Like, can you tell us a bit about that and how are your Jewish ethics especially relevant now as we're dealing with like the coronavirus? Yeah, you know, I always kind of thought like, I don't, don't we all think we're good people, right? Like, I don't like cheat or steal. Like, I, I'm nice to people. Like, I, I don't know. I don't. I think I'm a good person. But I think studying Jewish ethics made me realize that, like, I'm not really a great person, right? Like, if you look like the kind of ethic of modern life is like, you do you as long as you don't hurt people, right? Like, the ethic of American law is like, don't steal people's property, don't physically hurt them, don't infringe on their civil rights or their civil liberties. But like. The law doesn't say anything about being kind or generous or loving or caring or honest, right? Or courageous or mature or wise, right? Like that's that's not covered in any of these things. So it's like, well, where do you learn about that? And I think Judaism for me has been a great place to learn because even with something as simple as speech, like I never really thought much about gossip, right? Like we just say you gossip, you talk about people, like what? Well, that's not so bad, right? It's a little thing. But, you know, a perfect example of how that can actually be bad is if like, you know, let's just say, like, 
Haley, we're like, we're, we're friends, okay? And I'm like, and we get into a fight and I'm very mad at you, so mad. So I call up like five other people and I'm like, Haley, she's the worst. She's so mean. She's not smart. I don't trust her. She's not honest. I hate hanging out with her. And then I feel better, right? Like I got it off my chest. Then the next day we get back together and we realize it was a misunderstanding. We apologize. We feel bad. Problem is I just told five people some pretty nasty things about her. And now maybe those people, they told some people who told some people. And then maybe like, I don't know, a couple weeks from now, someone's throwing a party and they're like, oh, should we invite her? And they're like, oh no, I heard some bad things about that girl. Like, I, I don't, you not want her around. Like, don't do it. Or she's like running for a club at her school and they're like, oh, don't elect her. Don't elect her. That girl is like bad news. It's like, wow. I just, in one moment of getting something off my chest, I like really, it really impacted your life. Mm -hmm. So I think it's made me think more carefully about speech. Judaism has a lot of wisdom about shaming people right, about like being very careful not to embarrass people or humiliate people or call people out in a way that really hurts them. Think about social media. That's like what people do all day long. And then finally, the idea of chesed, right, like thinking about chesed, which means loving kindness. This is the Jewish thinking that says when someone you know is struggling, don't just like send them a text or like send them some flowers. Like, like you got to show up for them, right? It says go visit them in the hospital. Go be present with them if they lose someone they love and there's a funeral or a shiva. And we can't do that right now, right? We can't actually be physically present for each other, but we can certainly be really present to each other through screens. So like when we're supporting each other and talking to each other, like, are you also texting? Like, are you also on social media? Are you on Instagram? Or are you like really deeply present for someone right now in this really stressful and scary time? Um, I just think that's really important. There's actually a really beautiful story from an ancient text about this rabbi named Rabbi A, and he gets sick. And Rabbi B comes, takes Rabbi A's hand, and heals him. Then Rabbi B gets sick and Rabbi C comes and takes Rabbi B's hand and heals him. And it's like, wait, wait, wait. Okay, Rabbi B was able to heal Rabbi A. Why didn't Rabbi B just heal himself? And the answer is that the prisoner can't get himself out of prison. There's a, there's a sense in which sometimes we get imprisoned in our own like fear and anxiety and loneliness. And we just need someone to reach out and be with us and get us out of that. And I think that's something that we could all really work on doing right now. So just to follow up to like shifting a little bit towards the coronavirus, where are like, where are you now? And what, like, how are you dealing with this personally? Yeah, so I'm, I'm home in my apartment in Washington, DC. And I, don't, I found it to be really hard to concentrate. Very, like I just feel very distracted. I feel like I'm always checking the news. I feel like I'm worrying a lot about my loved ones, my friends. I'm just constantly kind of checking in on people. And I just feel like, and I feel like, things take a long time, right? So like just leaving my house is kind of a hassle because like I wash my hands and not touch doorknobs and there's just, it just like feels like a lot. So I haven't, you know, I really wanted to start working on another book, but I haven't really done that yet. What I've been doing instead is just trying to volunteer to help friends out. So I've been helping friends with some writing who are trying to save their nonprofit organizations or doing scientific work. I've just been trying to kind of support them in their work. And I've just been trying to be here for friends who are having a really hard time, whether they're like home with small children and just really stressed out or they're, they're sick. I have one friend who's sick. So I've just been like reaching out to him and trying to support him. So I, you know, I've been trying to just practice chesed, practice that loving kindness that Judaism asks of us, um, have not been very productive. And I think that's really okay right now. Sorry, we're just chatting really quick in the No worries. Okay, so the next question is, why did you decide to write a book on Judaism in the first place after you left the White House? Like, what was your inspiration and how did you get going on all of it? Yeah, so I, you know, I grew up maybe like, maybe like some of you were like, Judaism for me was these two very boring services at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then a very boring Seder at Passover and Hebrew school, which like I didn't love. And like, that was Judaism. And I just thought like, okay, well, I don't, I don't have to do this, right? Like, I, I might be culturally Jewish or Jewish by heritage, but, like, I'm not going to do Judaism. Like, if I want, you know, meaning or, or purpose or spirituality, I'm not going to find it in Judaism. I have to look elsewhere. I'll just be, like, cultural Jew. And then 25 years later, I, at the age of 36, I broke up with a guy I've been dating. I had all this time on my hands, and I just randomly wound up taking an intro to Judaism class just to fill my time, just looking for things to do, and I was really amazed by what I found. You know, it, it turned out that Judaism isn't just three boring holidays. It's actually like 
all of this wisdom about how to be a good person and how to live a worthy life and how to have a, an adult spirituality, like a, an adult conception of God that, that feels plausible and that feels really moving. And so I just started reading like hundreds of books. I took all these classes. I attended silent Jewish meditation retreats, which were actually a thing. And I decided, like, I found like the books were either very intro nuts and bolts, which are fine, or they were very sophisticated and academic, which were kind of hard to read. And so I just decided I wanted to write a book that I needed, right? Like a book that covers the basics, but also really unearths the deeper insights about how is Judaism relevant to your life right now, right? To making, t to your struggle to like be a good person, to your challenge of figuring out like, what do I do with my life? What kind of life is a life well lived? And also to like start answering people's questions about God and spirituality. And I think oftentimes in Judaism, we don't talk a lot about God, right? It's, it's a little weird. Like we show up at our synagogues and we say prayers and we talk, we have all these names for God that we use, but like, we don't necessarily talk about what we mean by that. And, you know, I think that that's in many ways wonderful because it reflects this Jewish humility that we have, that we don't have some, some like definition of God. Like you won't see anywhere in Judaism that's like, God is this thing and you must believe that or you are not a Jew, right? That, that's not how we roll because I think we have the humility to say like, whoa, this God thing is just like so much bigger than any of us can just can d define for ourselves, right? So I, I really, you know, I kind of just appreciate that about Judaism. Yeah, so um, you mentioned that in your social distancing, you were going to start writing your second book. Um, do you have any idea about what you want this book to be about or maybe a little sneak peek? Yeah, so I'd actually, it's a very, you timed that question perfectly because I was just starting to talk about God. I actually want to write a book about what Judaism has to offer about God and the divine. You know, for me, this is something I've really struggled with because, you know, when someone says, okay, God is like a being that who controls everything and rewards you if you're good and punishes you if you're bad. Like I look around, I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's true. Right? Like I see really good people being terribly punished. I see really awful people doing terrible things and not being punished. And like, okay, if there's a God that wants this to be the way this is, like I'm not comfortable. Like I can't, I, I just, that's not okay with me. I'm not going to believe in that kind of God. So I'd always thought, well, I'm an atheist or maybe I'm like spiritual, but not religious. But studying Jew Jewish theology and spirituality made me realize like, guys, Judaism has so many different moving ideas of God and the divine. Right? There are Jewish mystics who say, everything is God. You guys are God. I'm God. The idea that there's any barrier between us, like that's not true. So if I walk by a homeless man on the street who asked me for help, like that man is actually God. That man is like the divine, is sacred, is precious. Right? That's a really pretty powerful idea. There's a guy named, a uh, Jewish thinker named Martin Buber, who says that in those moments when you are connecting deeply with another person, like when you are just you are with them and you are talking and you are sharing your fullest self and they're sharing their fullest self and you're both like super vulnerable and just not distracted by anything else in those moments of deep connection god arises right what arises between the two of you in relation is god there's a thinker named mordecai kaplan who says that god is the process by which we each become our best and highest and truest selves so whatever the process is that helps like you know, a good football player, you know, a bad football player become a good football player or a dishonest person become an honest person or a seed become a plant, like that process, that growing and actualizing process, that's God. I was like, this isn't bad, right? Like there are a lot of these things that I find very moving. And, you know, there's another thinker named Arthur Green who says like, don't worry so much if the whole like being idea of God as a being, it's hard for you. Think about like, moments when you've just been like swept away by the beauty of nature or been in deep connection with another person or just seen something that has just like touched you and inspired you in such a way, like, is there something divine about that? So I just think Judaism offers so much, so much wisdom and insight about the divine and God. And I'd love to just explore that and share it with people. Okay, great. So the next question that we have for you is that you wrote that you had a God-shaped wall in your life. Mm. Can you explain to us what you meant by that? Yeah. So I think it just, my whole life, I was really stuck. I was really kind of um, just stuck with this idea that like God is a man in the sky who controls things. And for me, that was kind of this like wall in the shape of an old man with a beard that I just couldn't get beyond, right? I felt really stuck with that. And it was a very, it's a very intellectual idea. Like God is this being in the sky. It's like a concept, right? You don't, it's not just something necessarily to me you feel. So I just thought, well, okay, I can't believe that. So I guess I can't, 
heavenly spirituality. But I think, you know, by studying all these different Jewish conceptions of God, and also by just like, just having actual experiences, right? Whether it was on Jewish meditation retreats or in prayer or out in nature or with other people that felt to me transcendent or divine, like that also to me kind of opened up connection to something bigger. Um, and so I think, you know, once I realized that that God-shaped wall was just, that was just a figment of my imagination. Actually, Judaism does not just say God is a man in the sky who punishes you when you're naughty, right? That's not what Judaism says. We say many things that are much deeper and more sophisticated and more complex than that, but many of us just don't know about them. So I think getting past that wall for me was about learning. Definitely. So can you just talk a bit, a little bit about how did your Jewish journey affect your work in politics? Yeah, so I think, you know, my Jewish journey didn't like change my opinions on politics, but it did help me realize that so many of the things I was working on and fighting for in politics were actually so deeply rooted in Jewish values. So I think about, you know, what do I think is like the core animating Jewish idea? I think it's the idea that we're all created in the image of God. And that's actually a line from the Torah, which is like our key holy text. Um, it's, it says that all human beings are created in the image of God. Now, doesn't matter whether you believe in God, don't believe in God, not relevant, don't worry about it. Basically what this phrase means, and a rabbi named Yitz Greenberg puts it so beautifully, he says, it means that we're all infinitely worthy, we're all totally equal to each other, and each of us is unique. We each have this whole world of potential to bring that's like, there's no one else like us. And, you know, when I think about that idea, it's like, none of us really believe that. Like, you think you do, but like, do we really? No, right? Like, I walk by, you know, if you walk by a person on the street who's homeless and in need and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you. If that were Barack Obama on the street, you wouldn't walk by, right? If that was a celebrity on the street, you wouldn't walk by. You'd be like, oh my gosh, whoa, that person's so famous. Oh, cool, can I get your autograph? So we actually don't think people are infinitely worthy and equal and unique. And once I understood that this was Judaism's core idea, I was like, oh, every speech I'm writing is about this. You know, Mrs. Obama is writing a speech about having like, you know, kids who are, come from really tough backgrounds be able to go to college, she's saying each of these kids is infinitely worthy and totally equal to other kids and they each have a unique world of possibility to offer. So I think I really, I kind of appreciated how that core Jewish idea very much was about what I was doing in politics. That's great. So the next one that we have for you is, can you tell us um, about an inspiring Jewish moment that actually occurred during your time in the White House? Yeah, so, you know, I remember attending one of the Hanukkah parties that we had every year at the White House, and these things are, like, huge. You have, like, 700 Jews, you know, crowding into the White House. They have, like, you know, they, they make, they kosher the whole place. They make the whole kitchen kosher, which is kind of amazing. They have, like, all this food. You know, it's, like, they have, like, a Jewish acapella group, and it's very cool. And we were, you know, there's, like, 700 people there, and just spontaneously, people started singing Ma'o Sor, which is, like, a you know, it means Rock of Ages. It's like a, it's a Hanukkah song. It's a it's song traditionally sung at Hanukkah. And they were singing it like in Hebrew in the White House. And I just thought like, I don't even think, like my grandparents could never have imagined that 700 Jews would be singing a song in Hebrew in the White House. Like even my parents, I don't think could have imagined that. And just to be there with all these Jews and the president and first lady of the United States, like watching us sing this song, it was, it was pretty inspiring. Yeah, definitely. So we have one last question for you, and then we'll turn it over to the chat for any questions from the group. Can you just tell us uh, any fun or crazy stories you have from the White House? Yeah, so, um, so I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one from, uh, this was back in 2009. I was writing for, for President Obama back then, and I wrote his first college graduation speech, which was for the graduation at Arizona State University. And I gave him the speech like a week and a half in advance. I'd spent like weeks working on it, got it to him well in advance. I heard nothing. So I figured he was fine with it. And I'd written like exactly what he asked for. The morning of the speech, I get a call saying, the president wants to see you in the Oval Office immediately. And I was like, that's not good. Like he is definitely not inviting me in there to be like, good job, Tiger, right? It's like, clearly something is wrong. So I like, I'm like still getting dressed. So I like rush in, I'm totally a mess and disheveled. I get there, I'm like, I'm like panting so I've been running and we sit down and he's like well look uh it's not the speech I want to give and I was like this speech is tonight and he's like yeah I don't want to I don't want to give this speech I want to give a totally different speech so he just dictates the outline of like a totally different speech no relation to the speech I just spent weeks working on I was like oh my I have to write a whole new speech that I spent two weeks writing I now have to write it in like eight hours 
So I like run back to my desk and like rewriting, rewriting. You know, I give him a draft. He doesn't like it. It's not new enough. I'm like writing again, writing again. I realize I'm going to miss the motorcade that takes staff from the White House to Air Force One. Staff travel by car, which takes like, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. The president travels by helicopter in Marine One, which takes like 10 minutes. So they got me on the helicopter with him so I could have more time. So I'm like, I'm like there with my little, my laptop and my paper and I'm like all current and the helicopter is so tiny. Like my knees were almost touching him. Like it's just a tiny little space. And so I'm like trying to write the speech. And he looks at me as we're flying over, you know, the Washington Monument. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, dude, I'm, I'm working on your speech. And he was like, he's like, stop writing the speech. Look around, enjoy the view. How often are you going to see this? Like, that's crazy. Okay. So we get on the plane, still writing the speech, still editing it. I'm trying to like, the, the computers back then on Air Force One were very slow. So it was just like, they were getting stuck and being really slow. The plane lands, I'm like struggling to print out the speech. We get in the motorcade, we're driving to the university. I'm still editing. We get there and I'm like, well, this could be a disaster. I have no idea. Just wrote a speech in a day. And he just like stepped up to the podium and delivered the speech like he had been doing it for his whole life. It was so like, I, I've never seen anything like it. It was, and at no moment during that entire day, did he look at all stressed out or anxious. He was just like totally unflappable, not bothered at all. I was very anxious and very stressed out. So that was not, not great, but yeah, that was, that was quite a day. Oh my gosh, that sounds like an amazing story and a hilarious day and how thoughtful of him to, to let you look out the windows and I know. appreciate the, you know, the moment that you're in, which I also feel like is like what we're in right now in the yeah. world. And we have a couple questions coming in in the chat. So um, I'll take a stab at asking you those if that's okay. Great. Um, the first one we have is from Tova who asked if you have a social media account or contact info so that we can continue to follow you. Yeah, so um, I kind of hate social media. I think it's corrupting our society and destroying our souls, but it's also important for promoting a book. So um, I have a Twitter account, which is just at here all along, which is my book title. And then I have a website, which is just sarahferwitz.net, and it has a contact form on it. And if that contact form goes right to my email, so you can just email me right through that. Perfect. I also have a terrible, and like I have an Instagram account that I've never used, which is here all along book, but it's, I've never used it. So just crushing the social media guys. I'm just rocking it. It's amazing. If you decide you want to use it, I bet we have a lot of uh, Instagram savvy <laughs> people who'd be happy to help you out with. I have to hire one of you to teach me how to do it. Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, the next question is from Andrew. Um, he said, in your book, you mentioned that you sent the, oh, scrolling on me, sorry. You sent the book to several different rabbis that you met with and learned from to see what they thought. Some agreed and some really disagreed um, on some of the same paragraphs and points that you made, which is like so rabbinic. Um, how do you get to the point where you felt comfortable publishing the book despite all of the different feedback? Great question. What a Andrew. great question. And it was, I, I so appreciate that question because for me, I really approached this book, even though I read hundreds of books, like I'm not an, I'm not an expert, right? I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a scholar. I don't know what I don't know. So for me, my concern was like, I just want to know every counter argument to what I'm saying. And I, you know, and if I, if I agree with that, fine, I'll change it. But I might still disagree. I might disagree with that counter argument. Then good. I know, I know what I'm saying is right for me. So I think that basically I figured, I decided like once I just heard enough people kind of, you know, once, once like three or four really like very traditional Orthodox rabbis have said, okay, here are my disagreements with you. Then I felt like, okay, I think I have a sense of what, you know, real, a really traditional perspective would be and that, and I, and I, I honor it. And maybe I'm going to tweak what I'm writing a little bit just to kind of honor that and to kind of say like, oh, some people disagree with me and that's fine. And here's what I think of that. Right. But like once I just had a good sense that I knew the counter arguments, then I felt comfortable publishing it. But I think you can, you can kind of drive yourself crazy by being a perfectionist, right? By saying like, there can't be anything wrong. It has to, I have to know every counter argument in detail. And like, at some point you just have to let it go. And that's kind of what I had to do. This one's a little bit similar, but I think pulls out also, um, yeah. which is asking if you ever faced any backlash when you were developing your own beliefs in Judaism, and if so, how did you react to it in that moment? And there's this, there's a second question that, again, could be similar, so I'll, I'll pitch it to you now, and, and you can yeah. decide. Um, have you felt any anti-Semitism while working in politics? 
Yeah, great question. So with the first question, you know, I was really worried when I published my book that very traditional Jews would sort of have a lot, a lot of objections to it or feel like I, my practice wasn't authentic or would disagree with me. Um, and it's been so interesting. It's been the opposite, actually. Like, I've actually gotten really warm and enthusiastic feedback from a lot of folks who are very traditional in their observance and whose practice is very different from mine, but they really like the book. And I think that ultimately what they're responding to is they're like, okay, I disagree with a lot of what you wrote, but I see that you really did your homework. Like you really did a lot of research and learned a lot and you acknowledge my argument and then disagree with it. Okay, like they see that I've done my homework and they also see that I just love Judaism and as, am as passionate and excited about Judaism as they are, even if we practice it differently. So I actually haven't really seen any like blowback or criticism of my book. I mean, if you guys see it out there, like definitely let me know, but it's been pretty positive. So that's been very meaningful to me. In terms of anti-Semitism and politics, you know, I really, it, I, I feel incredibly lucky in saying this. I really didn't. You know, the Obama White House was, I mean, I was so, I was felt so at home and comfortable and proud to be Jewish in the Obama White House. It was a place that just so valued diversity and so honored people's cultures and backgrounds and religious traditions, right? Like, I think we celebrated every religious holiday in the White House, right? Just like, we were D Diwali, you know, Ramadan, Christmas, Hanukkah, like, it, we did it all. And I felt really, I mean, you know, I, Jack Liu was an Orthodox Jew who was the White House Chief of Staff and then the Treasury Secretary. Rahm Emanuel, another Jew who's the White House Chief of Staff. David Axelrod, Senior Advisor to the President. Jewish, right? Like so many Jews were at such high levels. So I really, I really just had, I, I just didn't really experience anti-Semitism during my time in politics. Um, I think now would be very different. We're in a sort of different era, but back then I didn't. Awesome. And I think we'll ask one more question um, for, for everyone's time and your time, especially Sarah, since we're so grateful and it's a perfect one to end on. Great. It's actually two that I'm going to combine, um, which is what advice do you have for young people or teens who want to enter politics, government, or writing? Yeah. It's kind of two separate ones, but I merged. Great. I love it. So I think if you want to enter, uh, enter politics or government or, or like speech writing, anything kind of political, you know, the best advice I can give is like, to the extent possible, do an internship. And this doesn't have to be, look, it's expensive to do an internship in Washington, DC. You have to pay for housing and food and transportation, like not everyone can afford that. So that's not an option for a lot of people. But can you do an internship while living at home? Like, can you intern in your local mayors or city councils or like town council office, right? It doesn't have to be for a, a US Senator, it can be for state government or local government, like just getting that hands on experience is so important because a lot of the hiring in politics, it actually comes from people seeing that you actually have previous experience. Like, I'm not really so interested in what your grades are. That doesn't, it's not really relevant. I'm really interested in whether a former employer of yours, I can call them and they can say, oh yeah, this person is great. They're great. I know they'll do a good job. So I think just like getting experience is so important. And I think for writing, that's the same thing. Like if you want to be a speech writer or a journalist, getting the actual experience, maybe it's like you write a speech for your high school principal, right? Like that person is a leader. That person gives speeches. Maybe you help your high school principal give a speech. Maybe you help some local elected official or a local business person or just someone who has to give a speech. Maybe you help them write it, right? So I think that, and I also think like reading good writing is really important. Like reading former good speeches, reading historical speeches. I think that's really important too. Would, I, would it kill you if I asked one more question? It, no, really as many really as you want. Please. Okay, I this so may be really the last one, um, which is what's the best way to get involved and learn about Judaism aside from, of course, BBYO? Love it. Definitely BBYO. Start there for sure. And, you know, I think, I think this is the best question because I think it's different for every person because people learn and engage so differently, right? So for me, it was really important to take an introductory class. I just, I just felt so kind of lost on my own. It was so helpful to just have a rabbi or an educator just kind of like walking me through stuff. That was really helpful. For me also, I learn a lot by reading. So it was just so helpful to just read some introductory books. You know, and I, I actually wrote my book for this purpose because look, people don't have like a hundred hours to sit around learning about Judaism and there's a million books out there, right? You just can't keep track of all of them. So like I went and read all those books and then I just wrote one book, which I was trying to just like, like call out 
the really like the best stuff, the stuff that's the most inspiring and transformative and wise and just put it in a book that would kind of help you understand the basics, but also really inspire you. So like, you can start with my book. Joseph Teleshkin is a wonderful rabbi who writes amazing introductory books about Judaism. So does Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. He's written some amazing books. So like books like that are helpful. But I also think like experiences are helpful. Maybe you host a Shabbat dinner. I mean, not, not now, right? But like, maybe it's just for your family, right? You like actually go online, figure out what the prayers are, maybe learn to bake a challah, just the bread that you eat there. Like maybe you just do it yourself. Right? Like, just like have an experience. Maybe you take a real a leadership role in your own Passover Seder. Maybe you have a Shabbat dinner by Zoom with some of your friends, right? And you guys like do it together or your BBYO friends. Like, you know, that kind of hands on learning is really powerful. And I also think like having spiritual experiences, right? There are like meditation classes and retreats for younger people. It's so, like for teenagers, for college students, so, like kind of exploring Jewish spirituality in a way that is meaningful to you. Maybe you learn about Jewish prayer. Maybe you just try spontaneously doing personal prayer to God or to whatever word you use for whatever it is you connect to. I don't, you know, you do you. But like, I think, you know, there's just, there's so many different ways. Maybe you like history or art or sports or language, whatever it is that excites you. I think finding that angle in is good, but I definitely think like having, you know, reading some intro books, taking it into a class is pretty helpful. Amazing. Well, thank you, Errol, for asking that question. What a perfect, perfect way for us to end our time together. And um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jared and Haley for moderating thank and you asking guys. this awesome question. Hope everyone has a wonderful week um, and looking forward to seeing your faces on demand many more times. Stay healthy and well and see you soon. Bye, y'all. Thank you so much. Bye.